वेलकम फ्रेंड्स टू दिस थ्री डे मेडिटेशन वर्कशॉप इन राइस लेक विस्कॉन्सन आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू सी सो मेनी ऑफ माई फ्रेंड्स फ्रॉम अराउंड द ग्लोब प्रेजेंट हियर फ्रॉम अराउंड एवरी कंट्री दैट आई बिल टू सो ऑल ऑफ यूर वेलकम हियर टू दिस वेदर रेनी वेदर इन विस्कॉन्सन दिस थ्री डे मेडिटेशन वर्कशॉप इज गोइंग टू बी स्पेशल because i am going to reveal some things i have not done before in any workshop it happened by accident that this became special only a few days ago i was sitting in my wife's house in bruce with the permission of course <laughs> and i was looking out of the window looking at the beauty of the landscape outside and it was so beautiful there were two fluffy cumulus clouds all they approaching each other and i was very happy to see how even clouds are attracted to each other and i saw the beauty of the sunlight behind it and the green grass and the trees and i said what a perfect picture nature has painted suddenly occurred to me is it really coming from outside or is this whole scene inside i realize nothing is outside the whole picture is inside us projected outside and very often these experiences outside are symbolic of what is happening inside when i saw those two clouds merging i was so impressed by that merger of the clouds i happened to mention it to a friend of mine my guardian angel you mccaffrey who must be sitting somewhere here can you rise there is my guardian angel <laughs> and if you want to know how he became my guardian angel he will tell you in the lunch break <laughs> and he will tell you the story of how he became my guardian angel and has been taking good care of me ever since he happened to come in right at that time so i mentioned this to him that look at this scene and how we project such beauty outside actually i was not original in saying that i thought i was expressing something original but my memory went back to 1938 when i was standing in the garden with great master azur maharaj baba sawal singh my master and we were both standing in a garden and there were clouds on the sky and there were mountains there and i pointed out to great master I said master how beautiful this beautiful scene is in the mountains he said it is so beautiful but it's coming in a dim way from inside you go inside you'll find the same thing in real bright colors i then realized that everything we see outside is really coming in a dim way outside and therefore i was not original when i made that comment to my guardian angel and he as a very faithful guardian angel went to practice it in his own house <laughs> next morning he came for breakfast and told me of the experience he had the greatest experience the experience of the merger of the clouds two clouds becoming one and that set the theme for this meditation workshop the theme is am and am not a candy <laughs> meditation and merger the ultimate aim of meditation is merger and earlier i used to criticize merger i used to say that when i was very young somebody told me that this is a great spiritual path we are a drop from an ocean and the drop has somehow been separated from the ocean and has been flung far away into this creation and this soul the drop from the ocean is now struggling hard to go back and merge in the ocean that was the concept of merger i was explained is the role of a spiritual journey spiritual path i was very upset with that role because of the simple reason that if i am a drop 
have a beautiful drop. When the sun shines on me, I see the whole rainbow in it. I have my own personality, my identity. And what is the spiritual path going to do to me? I'll go and merge in the ocean. Ocean will make no, ocean will make, have nothing to do with one drop adding to it. It will remain the same ocean. Ocean gains nothing by one drop going into it. And I lose everything that I have. I'm no longer a drop. What kind of spiritual path is this? I decided not to follow this path. Just because of this explanation given to me that we are a drop from the ocean, separated from the ocean, one day we'll merge with the ocean. It took me quite a while to discover that was not the truth at all. We were not drops that were separated from the ocean. We were drops in the ocean. This realization came many years later that we were never separated from the ocean. We only lost the awareness of being an ocean. We only contracted our awareness from a huge ocean to a drop. How big is a drop? It can be a big drop, it can be a small drop. We were just in stages contracting our awareness from totality of the ocean to small drops, smaller drops, till we became a very small drop and that's what we are today. And that very small drop is experiencing by the power of its own concentration and the concentration available because it's still part of the entire ocean. The entire ocean is at the back of that little drop because it never left the ocean. And that awareness, even though it's a drop, it contains the entire awareness of the ocean because it never left the ocean. The entire awareness, totality of consciousness, which we call the ultimate creator, is lying inside that one drop, which is our soul inside us. Of course, for the sake of experiences, for the sake of variety of experiences, the drop covered itself through its own power. The power of consciousness is amazing. What is the power of consciousness? The power of consciousness is to be conscious of anything it wants, it becomes a reality. It becomes an experience. There is no reality in experience. We make it real through our perceptions. We perceive a thing and call it real. There is no proof at all whatsoever, empirical or otherwise. Even scientists are recognizing it today. That there is no proof that anything else exists outside of our perception. Whether you use your perception through telescopes or microscopes, or use your perceptions through any other means, whether you use mental perception or physical perception, what you call reality is created by perception. So we have created these realities of different orders for a variety of experiences. That drop of consciousness, which is our individual soul, with the power of consciousness, with the power of creativity, it includes around itself, by its own creative power, something that can put the experience of a timeless, spaceless moment into time and space and makes a vast experience. The concept of vastness, whether in space or in time, comes up merely because of the power of that consciousness in that drop to create vastness and space and we call that power the human mind. It's the mind that creates time and space. If you take the mind away, all space and time disappears. The mind not only creates for the drop space and time, then is able to put events into it. And any amount of events it can put in through the power of consciousness, it lines up in that timeline and space line, which is infinite. It lines up several events. And we make that a part of destiny of a human being. When we travel on that timeline, we say we are going through experiences of life. But in order to make it even more realistic in experience, which should look like an externalized reality being created by us, we cover it with the power of separate perceptions. The mind has the power to perceive directly any experience. It does it. But we add on to the mind another layer around ourselves, the layers of perception. 
through senses. The sense perceptions are another layer added upon the mind so that we can now use the power of consciousness working through time and space into a perception of the events that we have been placing on the timeline and space line. We call the mind the causal self, the causal body. It causes all these things that we see around us to happen. That beautiful scene I saw outside was created by the mind. The beautiful people I meet are created by the mind. We are all using our mind to create all experiences. Therefore, it's the causal self. It's our causal body. It's a cover upon the drop of ocean that we call the soul. The sense perceptions are another cover upon the mind. And we call it our astral self. Because it's given us a shape. It's given us a shape to conform to the shape of space and time we have created outside. And through that shape, we divide perception into different forms of perception. We separate hearing from seeing. We separate smelling from touching. We separate these five and start experiencing the created reality in a different way. It's a beautiful experience, very well designed. We go so deep into this design that we make the external rules the external laws of nature, so precise, so detailed, that anyone having the experience can feel it must be real because it is so detailed. It's got so many details. And on top of that, we create a big brown envelope around this called the human body, the physical body, and put this whole package inside this body and take birth here and come as a human being. To have this whole experience as a human being, using the power of consciousness of the soul, the creation of space and time by the mind, the division of perception by the sense perceptions of the astral self, and seeing this world through a physical body. And one very big thing we do at that time, in order to block all this knowledge, to make this real, and not that this is a created thing from ourselves, we block it completely with a wall and that wall we build shutting out all knowledge of the future. Future was made up when we laid out all the events of the timeline. The entire, entire possible future has been already laid out but we block ourselves. So as we go through this process of having the experiences from one point of the timeline to another, we say we are living from moment to moment. Not only that, to heighten the experience of a physical life, we introduce through the mind a new principle that governs the interaction of all events, the principle of cause and effect. That nothing should be placed as an event upon the timeline if there is no cause to it. So the events are arranged in the order of cause and event. A cause is there for the event. We don't care if the event came first or the cause came first. But when you place them on a timeline, the cause is the cause of the event. Therefore, we created a past by making all causes the past and making the working of the cause as an event, the present, and all future events to which we are blocked and cannot see as the future. What a great design. This is what consciousness has been able to do. And we are all experiencing it right now. Now when you see all this, the other subtle elements added was that in this cause and effect, a mental activity has been added. The activity of choosing. The activity of saying, I have five choices, which winner will I make? In the timeline, we have made the decision already. But in the cause, we have put this. In the cause, we are putting, mentally thinking which choice should I make, this or that, this or that. And we make a choice. And the event that follows, which is pre-written, is exactly according to the choice we make. All choices we make here are pre-written, but we don't know them because we are blocked. Therefore, we think we have free will. Tell me a better way in which you could introduce the experience of free will. That when you design the whole thing together, you can still experience free will in the midst of this. 
He was a friend of mine when I was studying at the university at Harvard. A friend of mine wanted to know if there is real free will or no. So he went theologically into this question, religiously, at what does religion say? He found that religion, all religions, say there is a God and God is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful. Omnipresent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows everything, he is present everywhere, and he is all powerful. Now, look at the term all knowing. Does God know everything? If God knows everything, he must know our future. If he doesn't know our future, he is no God, then we are bigger than God. If we can make our own future, then he doesn't know about it. But the religion doesn't say that. Religion says, all religions say, God is all-knowing. Therefore, if God is all-knowing, that means it is our ignorance that we don't know what God knows and that's our future. When we make a decision, God already knows what is going to happen. Therefore, we don't have a real choice. We think we have because we are not God. If we were God, we would know. But if since we are not God, we are blocked from knowing the future, we think we are using free will and making a decision. Based on this argument in his head, he came to the conclusion, we have no free will. And he called me early morning one day, after he got this great revelation, he called me and said, Ishwar, I found the truth. We have no free will. I said, are you certain? If you are, come over and have a cup of coffee or tea with me. So I invited him to my apartment. And to play a little trick on him, I arranged a tray with a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and one cup I left empty. When he arrived, I said, you found out we have no free will. Okay, tell me without free will, did you have tea, coffee or nothing? I got all three cups ready. And don't say that you can choose now because you have no free will. He was stumped completely. I said, now I want to prove to you that not only do you have free will, you have no choice but to have free will. We are confronted with this choice every day. Every hour we are confronted with making a choice, this or that. So how can we say we have no free will? And you say, come to the conclusion theologically that we have no free will because God knows everything. He said to me, are you suggesting that God even doesn't know if I have free will? I said, no, God knows. Because God can read your thoughts, how you are making a decision. And he knows what decision you will make. And it's the only decision you will make. I said, now make a choice before we go further. He said, okay, I'll have coffee. So he, as he sipped his coffee, I said, I was telling you that you have free will. Now I want to take the other side and tell you, you really have no free will. And I will not go by theology. I'll go by science. I'll go by psychology, which is also called the science of the mind. I'll give you reasoning by scientific means that you have no free will. Let me tell you how. You decided to drink coffee and not tea. Let's examine what happened in your mind when you made a choice. You chose coffee for a number of factors that ran into your mind very quickly and said, okay, I'll have coffee. That's what you said. It was a decision you made. How do you make a decision? There are only two sets of factors in your head that enable you to make any decision in life. One, hereditary factors. Maybe your dad liked coffee. Maybe your grandfather liked coffee. Maybe it is in the genes. Maybe it's hereditary. And it came in and you couldn't help it. Therefore, you said coffee. The second set of factors are the environment you have been exposed to. If you have been with coffee drinkers and you got an acquired taste for coffee. So the environmental factors through which you have passed till this moment made you take coffee. I said, consider this. There is no third factor, no other reason why you can choose coffee. And these two factors environmental and hereditary 
are totally fixed at the time when you chose coffee. You couldn't change them. Therefore, what you call free will looks free to you because you don't know those factors. If you know, if you have knowledge of how you make a choice, you would know you have no free will. Those choices are earlier data fixed into your head is making that choice. You have no choice. But since you don't know that, nor do you know the future, these two combined give you the feeling of your free will. And that's why you have this experience of free will. Otherwise, you really have no free will. And I'm not relying upon theology at all. I'm not relying upon God to prove my point. So this is good. This is scientific. But we feel we have free will. What's the role of this? Why should we feel free will? When we go to an amusement park, we want to ride on a Ferris wheel. I went in London to a very nice Ferris wheel called the London Eye. It's very high. When you are up there, you have no choice whether the wheel moves or not. The wheel will move anyway. And you enjoy it. Why don't you say, I have no free will. I am in dis great distress because I have no free will. You have no free will, you enjoy it. Because it's programmed to run that way. Therefore, why are we having free will at all? These trees growing outside having the same soul as we have, have no free will. They grow by their own programs, genetic programs, and they grow and they die. Insects, birds, animals, no free will. They are all going by their instinct built into them, in the programmed into them, programmed into the DNA molecule, and they go by that. We are programmed also, completely. Our DNA is completely programmed like any tree, like any animal, like any bird, like any. But in the midst of this, because of ignorance of the future and the capacity of the mind to think, we create an experience of free will. So free will is a very unique experience. There are 8.4 million species of forms of human life, not human life, any life, any form of life, recorded in some ancient Indian scriptures. They even give the number of each species, how many there are, so detailed list. Out of 8.4 million, what they call Chaurasi Lakh, 84 lakhs, that's 8.4 million forms of life, species of forms of life. Human form is only one of them and occurs in the last list of 400,000 in that list. Out of all these 8.4 million, the only one form that has the experience of free will is the human form. Why is that? What of the necessity that you separate one particular species of form of life and invest it with a unique experience which does not exist but makes you feel you have it? The experience of free will. Very subtle reason for that. The reason is, and this is what I am going to reveal to you, the reason why we have the experience of free will is that we, being in this ocean, continuously having the experience of being in the ocean and yet being a drop, the whole ocean functioning within the drop and covered by these covers and creating experiences for our enjoyment and entertainment, we came into a carnival, into an amusement park, to have a right. We built up all the rights. We have all the rights. But we could get lost in the rights. And we didn't want to do that. We had to make some way to be sure we can go back when we want to. And out of the 8.4 forms of life in which we can have the experience of this created universe, we left one form of life in which we could go back. The life form of a human being in which the doorway to go back started with the experience of free will. It is free will that makes us feel we are seekers. If you did not have free will, you would never seek. Seeking would be out of order. Free will makes you a seeker, a seeker makes you find, and that's how you go. Therefore, it's our own design made up in order to escape from a trap. It was not a trap. Somebody 
wrote a comment on one of my talks which I saw yesterday and that said you have made contradictory statements he wrote, to, wrote on my talk and one talk you say that this is a carnival we came for a good time another you say it's a trap which one is correct I said both are correct we came for a carnival and turned it into a trap <laughs> We thought we were going to have a good time and go back. We made arrangements for going back. And then we got so lost, forgot what we came for and made this our only reality and got trapped. So the carnival itself has been turned into a trap. What was supposed to be an amusement, entertainment became suffering and sorrow for us. Great master used to give an example of a little child who goes into an amusement park, a carnival, with his parents, holding the hand of his father or mother, a little child, is enjoying all the rides. There's music going on, there are those uh, horses going up and down on that roundabout, and there are many go around, and there is that big ferris wheel, and they go up and down. Every, the child is enjoying all those rides. Supposing he loses the hand of the father or the mother, the child is lost. He screams. He's alone. And the very thing that was looking so wonderful looked like monsters to him. And the sounds that were so beautiful, music, looks like horrible monster sound to him. What has changed? Is the same thing still there? He has lost the hand of his parent. He doesn't know how to go back home. And the very carnival, which was supposed to be a place for entertainment and amusement, becomes a trap for him, in which he screams with pain. It is our state. So long as we know that we have come into this world just to have a created experience for our entertainment, that we have come here to a carnival and we made it up and we designed it and we did all the roller coaster ourselves. We did all the ups and downs. We made it like a pain and pleasure together to have an experience of pairs of opposites the best way we could arrange it. After having done all that, we made an arrangement to go back home. And if we don't know about it, if we forget about it, it's a trap. It's a horrible place. It's a miserable place to be in. Such a simple thing has changed. But what was that arrangement we made to go back home? The arrangement was in the different forms of life. There should be at least one form where you should be able to seek, find and go back home. That form happens to be the human form. And we are so lucky, those assembled here, that we have that form right now to go back home. Now when you think of going back home, the clouds come back into my mind that we merge, not merge into an ocean that's far away. We merge into our own reality. By merger, we discover who we are. By merger, what happens? What's the experience of merger? When we go to our true home, to our Satchikant, what will be the experience of merger? Will it be drop going and there's the rest of the world being around? Not at all. When you merge into your totality, your own true highest self, the Satpurush, the ultimate creator, the ultimate God, when you merge into that, you become that. And when you merge, you don't merge. The entire creation merges with you at that time. It's the most blissful, the most ec ecstatic experience that any human being can ever experience. If anybody can describe any experience more blissful than that, I'll change my whole opinion about my teachings. The most beautiful experience, the most blissful experience is the experience of that merger into our own true home and becoming one with the totality. The whole thing merges into it with us. Then we discover who we are. We are everything. We were everything all the time without knowing it. Just for the sake of our experience, we turned into something in which we became a small drop and felt we were separated because we couldn't see our own totality. What is a spiritual journey? It's not a journey at all. We don't go anywhere. We discover ourselves. It's a continuous expansion of our own awareness. It's a continuous expansion of our awareness to totality. Then we realize who we really are. 
It's then that you can say, we are all one. Sitting here, saying we are all one, but I don't like that person. <laughs> I, I, we are all one, but I hate that. I didn't like what you said. What kind of oneness is that? There you will never say that, because you know. Now the beauty I'm going to tell you is, once you have that experience, just once, your merger continues at all times, even right up to the physical body. You can have that experience and feel merged with people even when you are here. But not the other way around. It's not that you think of merger here and you think you are there. No. But if you have had that experience, then at every level you can merge. And then you realize the beauty of having a perfect living master in a physical body because you have an experience of merger with the physical body of that master in its astral form every day. And it gives you the same blissful experience that you have in such God. So you bring such God right here. You bring that beautiful experience right down here. You have it every day, all the time. This is what I wanted to reveal to you. The beauty of the spiritual path. It's not merely that one day we'll find what the reality is. One day we'll find out different levels of consciousness. That's silly stuff compared to what you get. What you get is totality of merger. A merger where the whole universe, the whole created universe of all levels merges into one. And you experience that. Now imagine the capacity of a human being with a single soul in it, having that capacity to have that experience while still being a human being and living here in this world. That capacity is with you. What arrangement did we make? When we were totality and we decided to have these experiences of individuality and individuation, what did we do? The individual individuation, the drop within the ocean, came up for the creation of the soul. And the very fact that the ocean, there is totality of awareness, and a drop with a drop awareness, was together, played a game. I'm just putting it in space-time because there's no way I can describe it. I'm telling stories, I must confess. We all have to tell stories when we're talking or something beyond the mind. But imagine that there is a continuous play of mergers going on between the drops. Why are they doing that? What was the cause? If there can be a cause. Of course, a causeless state. Cause comes after the mind. But let's put it like this for understanding. What could be the cause for a mind to understand? What could be the cause for this creation of souls within the total? Why were there parts created within the total? Because of one of the greatest characteristics of the total. An inbuilt qualification, quality of the total, which we call today love, L-O-V-E, love. Love is the most powerful thing because it comes directly from our totality. There's nothing greater than love and love was the nature of the totality. Has continuously been the nature of totality. Has trickled down all the way right up to here. Trickled down to all the species of the world. Trickled down in various forms of attractions and getting together, trying to merge, trying to do this thing. My hands are separate, try to merge, hold them together, feed them. People try to hug each other, try to merge. But the physical bodies have been separated. They can't merge. You can't merge, but in astral planes, or in higher planes, you can. And you don't know that experience till you go there. But this whole concept of love had to be experienced. It was just a quality. The quality became an experience when there was more than one and could merge. The souls within Satpurash, within the totality, merged with each other and separated and merged and separated and had a great time. They're still having a great time. We are having a great time. We are all of that. The great time is going on there. You can go and see it. Not only see it, experience it. It's all us. Nobody else. The totality of us is there as a totality of creator. So when we experience of merger led to a creation of a separation for the ability to merge. And that is why 
to a separation of his soul from his totality and then it merges into a totality and merges with each other also. Some souls merged, separated. They love this game. When they love this game so much, when they began to have the experience of a contracted awareness only of a soul, then they merged very close. And when they could not merge because they separated themselves completely for the sake of an individuation of experience, then they split themselves into two souls. Each soul became two souls. And herein came the question of gender. Male, female, man, woman, all that came up because the experience of love was still required. And it was one soul. So one soul became two for the same reason for which we did started the whole creation. It goes on right up to here. This experience, but once you go beyond that state, which we call in the technical definition of these levels of consciousness, we describe that par brahm, which is beyond the mind. Brahm is at the top of mind. Par brahm, beyond mind. Par brahm has two parts. The upper part is a part of Sajkhan but where you experience individuation of a soul. The lower part is where it splits into two and becomes gender. It is there that we created what we today call soulmates. These souls will join together when you ascend and one soul may be waiting there before you, one half of soul. But we call it full soul here. The soulmates is a reality, but not here. What we try to do is we find out, try to find our soulmates here. I used to give an example at one time that uh, if you have a stack of dinner plates here and they are all whole, a dinner party is expected and they suddenly somebody trips over them, they fall. They all crack into two pieces. So you quickly want to put them together, but you don't know which piece fits fit which glass. So you pick up them quickly, quickly and try to see the best you can. There are some kinks left in between them. You say, oh, this must match. That's how we do our soulmate matching here. <laughs> the little chinks left between us. Because we don't know where the other half is. The other half may be up in a higher level of consciousness. The other half may be waiting for, for us there. Or maybe another level. Or maybe another form of life. We have, with total ignorance, we try to make that matchmaking. But where does the desire for matchmaking come from? The desire for matchmaking, the desire for attraction in genders is coming from the split that takes place in the lower part of our Brahman, just above the mind. When you have experiences in spiritual progress, in spiritual methods of going into an expansion of consciousness or going into different levels of consciousness, when you reach that point, then you discover how this soulmate concept came into being, how it was used to experience the very fundamental quality of totality of consciousness, love. I'm not saying that love is the only, only quality. There are many other qualities. Love is one of the big qualities. The other quality is a continuous knowing of everything. A complete knowledge at all times of everything. Knowledge can't, it's not acquired knowledge. Knowledge is something basic. How does it spell out in human life? If love comes because we are attracted to people and we look for soulmates and expression of our love, how does knowledge come and expresses? There's a true knowledge which we all have and we have no doubt about it. And that is called I exist. Everybody knows. Nobody has ever denied it. If thousand people come and tell you, you don't exist, you say, I exist, I know it. <laughs> that knowing of something without a doubt is coming from that knowledge. How do we use that knowledge? Because just knowing you are there is not good enough. It's just a knowing. How do you use it? By what we call the intuitive knowledge, the intuition. Intuition works with that knowing. Intuition uses up in the sake of, for the sake of a knowledge about creation, intuition uses up the entire data that was laid out on the timeline and then 
gives you knowledge. It is distinct from logical knowledge which uses the data in front of the mind and analyzes, puts together and comes to a conclusion. It uses logic. Logic has some shortfalls. I must tell you, no matter how good the logic is. Logic, I studied logic at one time in school. And there they taught me that logic is of two kinds. The deductive logic and inductive logic. What is deductive logic? Deductive logic is given a data, you can deduce something within the data. Let me give an example of, of a deductive logic. That wall there is painted grey. This little piece is a part of that wall, therefore it's grey. That's deductive logic. Deductive logic does not go beyond the data known to the mind in front of it. It's just a deduction from what is there. It does not add to any new knowledge. Then comes inductive logic. Inductive logic says, to give a crude example again, where is this wall painted red? It turns this way, it must also be painted red. That's inductive logic. Inductive logic always have a maybe attached to it. It's never certain. But it has a it is using phrases like perhaps, probably, most probably, depending upon how good is your data from which you're predicting the future. It is based upon data to predict something which is not known, but based on the previous knowledge, the add-on, but always with a sense of uncertainty. Therefore, there is no certain knowledge of anything new at all, in logic at all. And the mind can use no method for learning anything except logic. So you can understand this logical knowledge is so limited compared to intuitive knowledge, which is using the entire data of creation to help you know what the knowing is. That is why when people ask me how to live life, I give a simple prescription. Make your decisions intuitively. Now what is intuitive? What comes suddenly without using logic, without using mind, without using time and space. If you think, it uses time. That's not intuition. Intuition does not involve thinking at all. If you think and say, I've come to a conclusion, my intuitive conclusion, that's not intuitive at all. That's using your mind. But when you get a sudden knowledge, what we sometimes call a gut feeling, inside feel. I suddenly feel like it. Why do you feel? I don't know. When reason is sometimes against that knowledge. When reason is saying one thing and the intuitive knowledge is saying something else. That kind of knowing, if you make your decisions on that intuitive knowledge and then use logic, use the mind to implement it, to carry it out, your life will become heaven on earth. You can try it. But what we are doing is the exact opposite of that. We reason out what we should do. And we reason out and say, no, this looks good. This next morning we find that was not good. Why? Because we didn't know something that came up later. Or we missed out something. We forgot something. Therefore, the decision was not good. We regret why we made that decision. Then we say intuitively implement it. So we are trying to use intuition to implement something which we make with reason. Whereas the true way is the other way, the other way around to use intuitive knowledge to make your decisions and use your mind, use your reasoning to implement it, to carry it out. That way life changes immediately. It's, it needs a little practice. Now that is where I sometimes go wrong when I say it needs a little practice. Because people start practicing how to have intuition. <laughs> and you can't practice it. How can you develop intuition? Can you develop intuition? We can develop reasoning power. We can develop reason. We can add to more data to our knowledge. We can add lots of things to develop logic and reasoning. How do we develop intuition? I'll tell you. The more you seek your true home, the more your attention goes toward that, your intuition develops by itself. Because it flows from there. Therefore, when your attention is directed towards that, intuition grows. People tell me, my friends telling me for the last 50 years, that when they turn to the spiritual path, 
and began to meditate and put their attention in, inward. Their intuitive knowledge came again and again, over and over. Gut feeling became very strong. Otherwise, they were always thinking what to do. So, one of the good things about meditation is, it builds up your intuitive knowledge. Meditation that can lead to the experience of merger uses when you are on that pathway. Intuition builds itself. So, don't think that we have to be miserable here in order to go back to our true home. Some people say that. I feel very surprised. How, how are they talking about it? If you are on your, with the awareness of your true home, going towards your true home, how can you be miserable? You will always be happy. You have found the way. You are going on the correct way. You are going inside. You are going within to the core of yourself. You are piercing these covers of the physical body. You are piercing the cover of the sense perceptions. You are piercing inside even your mind and going to the true form of your individual soul and from there you are expanding to totality of consciousness. How can you be miserable? This is the most blissful experience you can have. Therefore, if you are doing this meditation in the correct way, that's important. If you are doing meditation in the correct way, it will always be a happy experience. And you will go happily towards your true home. I call it true home because that's where we belong, that's where we are. I remember my first talk given in 1962 in a church in this country. Somebody got up in the middle and said, if uh, it is so good in our true home, why did you leave it? <laughs> and my answer straight away coming without thinking was, we never left it. We just lost the awareness of it. That's the truth. <laughs> we never left it. There's no journey. Bring back that awareness. How will you bring it? Remove from your awareness the covers that are upon it. And we know the covers. Physical body, which was created to have a physical experience of a physical world. The moment you lose this physical body, there will be no physical world. You will see an overlap of what is looking physical with what is looking astral. And then thereafter, if you are mo moving in the right direction, it will be only astral. Then there will be nothing else. It will be so different. Then you move further inwards towards your journey. It will astral will disappear because we created outside by your perceptions. Perceptions will disappear. Mind will perceive whatever is created. You will see the whole of this system of creation by the mind. You will find out how timeline was created. You will find out how destinies were created. You will know how you picked up a particular destiny. The whole knowledge comes up right when you leave that cover. And you leave even the cover of the mind. You discover who you are. First time you can say who you are. When Socrates said, know thyself, he meant that. He didn't mean just know your body or your mind or who you are. He meant know who you really are. You really are a unit of consciousness. Within totality of consciousness, that's your reality. All rest is covered upon it. And the ability to pierce those covers and goes in is in our hands as seekers using free will to seek. Great arrangement. There was a movie somebody recommended I should see that movie. I mentioned that in some talks earlier that the movie's name was Inception. Somebody, many of you might have seen it. In Inception, the movie, people can go into sleep states, dream states, and also dream within dream states. And some of the characteristics of that movie which appealed to me were, one, the time frame changes when you go into a deep dream state. You can, no dream ever lasts more than 12 minutes. Research has shown. Every 12 minutes you finish. Some dream lasts 6 minutes, 3 minutes, 7 minutes. And the longest dreams, experts have been watching the rapid eye movements and seen when the rapid eye movement comes, you are dreaming, you can wake up and immediately you tell what the dream is. And it doesn't last that long. But in a 12 minute dream, you can have a whole lifetime. In 1963-64, I was studying in a sleep dream clinic where they were doing experiments, putting people to sleep and putting cameras on them and putting electrodes and all that to study the changes in the vital signs and changes in the rapid eye movement. 
So there they would experiment and when they would see the rapid eye movement, they knew the person was dreaming. They would wake him up in the middle and say, what are you seeing? And they found that the bodies, physical bodies, reactions, and movements of the physical body corresponded with what they were seeing in a dream. For example, if the light eyelids were moving up and down vertically, they wake up the person, what were you seeing? I was seeing a waterfall. The, the scene which you were seeing in dream corresponded with the vertical movement. Somebody's eyes were moving horizontally, they'd wake him up. And what were you seeing? I was seeing a tennis match. So things like that, they were able to confirm that from the rapid eye movement of the eyes, from the eyelids, they could determine the type of thing that he was examining. Then they would wake up and record whatever the person spoke or read. When that person woke up in the morning, he had no idea he dreamt. He totally forgot all the dreams. We dream every night, all of us. We don't remember them. We say we don't dream. But we all dream. Now, in that movie, they show that you can dream and go with a dream and the time frame changes. I remember in one case, in a 12-minute dream, a man dreamt that he was a little child. He remembered his own childhood. That he grew up and he became very big. He went to college, he went to university, he got a great job, he became big, he married a girl he loved in school. Then he had children. Children grew up. He was very old and he was talking to his grandchildren. And then he woke up. All in 12 minutes. His whole life. Now in the movie, when you have a dream within a dream, third dream, you'd spend a whole life in a 10-minute dream. It was exactly corresponding to what we saw here in that clinic. So, I like that idea that the time changes in a dream. Just like time has been created for us here because we are not in our true home. It's a created time. And this is not a third dream. It's the sixth dream we are having right now. In, from the original, we have slept, dreamt, slept, dreamt. That's how we created uh, uh, the illusions of creation of various levels. And here the time has become infinite, just with the same process. But in that movie, they have an arrangement to wake up. In case the scenes become too terrible and horrible, it's miserable, they can wake up. For that, what they do is, in the wakeful state, they carry a little totem in their hand which has a pointed edge. So, in the dream, when they have a horrible thing, the hand in the physical body moves. And the pain of that little totem wakes them up. And they get up. They get out of that bad dream. Here they are doing the same thing. What is the totem? What the totem the soul is carrying while we are still in the human body. The totem is called the appearance of a human being called a perfect living master. That's just a totem, created by the same process in which you create the whole universe. How could the rest of the creation be an illusion and one person out of them should be different and should be not equally an illusion? Is that possible? So the human being whom we call a perfect living master is also an illusion. Then where is he? He is where the rest of it is inside. So our perfect living master whom we see outside is actually inside us, not outside. Outside is a reflected, created image of that master inside, which is part of the creation images outside of everything inside. It's just one part of it. But there is one difference. The rest of the projected universe that we create pulls us towards it and traps us and holds us here. This one part which we have kept as our totem pushes us back into reality, says go back and this is your arrangement to go back. We made this arrangement at inception in Sajkhand, in our true home. We made the arrangement before we ever got into this big Joy of creation or mess of creation. We can make either of them. So we did that. Therefore, such a person comes into our life. Why should he come? Why should he come in our dream? Why should he come in our thoughts? He doesn't because we don't look for it. So long as we take a created universe as the only reality, 
विच इज ट्रू एट वन टाइम वी टेक ओनली वन रियलिटी वन इल्यूजन लुक्स लाइक रियलिटी एज द ओनली रियलिटी राइट नाउ वी आर फिजिकल बॉडी वी आर लुकिंग आउटसाइड लिविंग आउटसाइड आउटसाइड ऑफ आवर इनर सेल्फ वी आर लिविंग आउटसाइड एंड थिंकिंग दिस इज द ओनली रियलिटी नॉट थिंकिंग लिविंग इट एज ओनली रियलिटी Is it a mistake to think it is real? No, it's designed to be real. We didn't make it to look real and be illusion. We designed it to be real because nothing is real at all except the self that created all realities. Therefore, you can't say this is real. This is unreal. Every piece that we create, which has no comparison in reality with any other piece, is a reality for us. We did not use. the creative power of consciousness to create illusions we use the creative power of consciousness through illusion to create reality we done a very good job so we have created this reality in which we live when you go to a higher level of consciousness this reality disappears but another level of reality more real than this comes up when you go to a still higher level a still more real reality comes up just like when we go to sleep and have a dream dream looks real while we are dreaming the moment we wake up it becomes unreal and a dream it's the same thing it's a successive wakefulness is that we come when we go from one level to another therefore we create reality now having created the reality somebody in that reality whom we call a perfect living master a human being like ourselves who is using the same power the power which the whole creation was set up the power of love he pulls us with his power of love and tells us this is not real go inside why can't he say it from inside if he is inside because we don't know what is inside we have no idea what is meant by inside sometimes we hear people say inside means close your eyes and meditate that is inside That's not inside at all. If you close your eyes, how are you inside? You're still outside. Only you can't see because you close your eyes. If you open, you are still there. <laughs> Closing eyes doesn't take you inside. So when somebody says the master is inside you, we close our eyes, we can't see him. At least when we open our eyes, we can see. We have not gone anywhere inside. People close their eyes and meditate, thinking they are inside. They're never inside. that always outside closing eyes doesn't take you inside inside has to be something else what is inside is when you can pull your attention from outside and put it inside which means when you can withdraw your attention do you know we were never taught how to withdraw attention we were always taught how to focus attention focusing attention means put more attention outside we train ourselves in putting our attention outside and never trained to pull the attention backwards withdrawal of attention is exactly the opposite of focusing attention on something when a, a master tells us we draw attention to the third eye center we close our eyes and say where is the third eye center we grow for it because it's dark we can't see in front of us we eyes are closed but the space is still the same outside we close our eyes it there there must be center here in the darkness and there i am sitting there i am now inside do you know you are outside still you are outside in front of the space not inside at all and we continuously assume now we are inside and now we are finding the master inside it's much better to open the eyes and see the master outside than to figure out something with your imagination and see something in front i sometimes give a little experiment to check this out close your eyes and you figure that there is something master you or you are sitting inside if a person says i am sitting inside behind my eyes okay when your eyes are open you want to touch your eyes you have a great coordination already built into your body over growth that when you want to raise your arm you can touch your eyes any time you like whether they are open or closed 
I can touch my eyes with my eyes open, I can touch my eyes with my eyes closed because the hands in coordination know where the eyes are in the physical body. Now close your eyes and say you are sitting there and bring your hands slowly towards the eyes. Slowly you are conscious where the hands are and you also know where you are sitting. When you will come here and you touch the eyes, you already crossed where you are sitting because you are sitting outside, not inside. You can check it out. So this concept that we can go within merely by closing our eyes and looking in front has no value at all. It's not going in at all. We can spend 40, 50 years of our life doing this and getting nothing. And people have done it. My friends have done it. So, this is a very important point. When you want to withdraw your attention, it is different from focusing attention. We try to focus attention on an image we make in front of us. That's not going within. If you want to go within, you must feel you are within. You must experience you are there. You can't see yourself. I am sitting on the chair. I can't see myself. I only know I feel. I can't see my eyes. Nobody has ever seen their eyes except in a mirror. We don't turn our eyes around and see ourselves. <coughs> the same thing happens inside. If you are inside behind the eyes, you can't see yourself. You only know you are there. If you know you are there, then you will feel that the eyes are in front of you. If you know you are there, you will know that the whole body, rest of your body is below you. This starting point, most important point. Do not waste your time trying to meditate without doing this first step. The first step is to feel you are inside, behind the eyes, at the third eye center, which is behind the eyes, not outside of it. And Feel you are there. How do you feel? The simple thing you have been given a great talent for that. It's called imagination. Therefore, the best thing is not to try to focus anywhere. Imagine you are there. Can we do that? Supposing I were to tell you, imagine you are standing in that corner. Most of you will be able to imagine that you are there in the corner. Well, how did you imagine? Your attention went there to the corner and your attention was there, you felt you were there. Same process. You imagine you are behind the eyes and you are inside the head. When you imagine you are inside the head, how will you feel? Eyes are in front of me, the physical eyes. My ears are on either side of me. They are not behind me, they are inside the side of me. My back is behind I can move forward and backwards inside my head. I can turn upside down in the head. I can stand up and sit down inside the head. I can turn right or left inside the head. When you feel that, you're ready for meditation. If you can't do that, it's a waste of time. We have been wasting our time for lifetime sometimes. <laughs> it is very important that if you want to get the kind of success we talk about, what good is this hearing lectures about a true home and such kind and different levels of consciousness if all we do is to close our eyes and waste our time? <laughs> Therefore, I have invited you to come here to join me in real meditation. Not in a fake meditation of closing eyes and repeating words. Can you imagine these words that we create are all physical words? No matter how strong the mantra is, they are physical words, we are repeating. There are no words above the mind. True home has no words except the power of love, the power of intuition, the power of bliss and joy and ecstasy, the power of that feeling. There are no words there. Some people think we can repeat words and go to our true home. Nobody has gone there by repetition of words, no matter what words they are. These words which we repeat have only limited Limited use, of course, very good use, but limited use. Understand the value of repetition of Simran or Mantra or words. It's extremely limited. It is limited to repeating with your mind to stop the mind from thinking other things, to be able to hold your attention within yourself, period. That's the purpose of repeating these words. But words can have a little better meaning also if they are uttered by 
a perfect living master. Because he can, with his, because he is aware of all levels at all times, that the definition of a perfect living master, that he is not somebody who had an experience and has come back to tell us about it. A perfect living master who, while in his living body, in a physical living state, is having the experiences which we are talking about right to the top, right to totality. If he is not having that experience, he is not a perfect living master by my definition, which I accept. Therefore, a perfect living master with that kind of awareness, he can invest a certain additional power in those words we repeat for the sake of holding our attention there. And that power invest these words with helping that seeker not to be deflected from his seeking, not to be deflected from his path by negativity. That's the purpose of empowerment of those words. The words of Simran mantra that these holy people or masters give is first to use it as a mechanical method of squeezing out words of thought by continuously repeating those words. And secondly, if they have been uttered by a perfect living master, to use them to prevent any negative things or negativity to come around you. Very good useful things, but useful to start with. They don't go up all the way to our true home. The true home is beyond the mind, beyond words. So that is why we should know what we, what we are going into. That you could say prayers. People love to say prayers. They ask me, should we pray? Sure. Are prayers answered? I say 50-50 chance. <laughs> I'm being realistic. I'm being realistic. You throw a coin, what's the chance of getting heads or tails? 50-50. <laughs> so prayers is answered 50-50. It can go in your favor, may not go in your favor. Some prayers are answered, some are not. But I can tell you one thing. If you want to make effective use of prayer, pray to send a message to your true self. Send a message to God. Send a message to whoever you believe is the ultimate creator. Pray to send a message about where you are, where you are. And don't expect an answer. When you expect an answer to your prayer, that means you want the prayer to be fulfilled. That's not prayer, that's a business transaction. <laughs> okay, I give you a prayer, you give me back some. That's not a real prayer. A real prayer is when you pray to somebody who knows more and you want to state your condition, I am in this state. Then leave it at that. What is the best will be the answer to the prayer. Not that you determine what is best. If you knew what is best, you would struggle hard for that. We pray when we can't do something. So that is why the prayer is also use of words. These are all mental activities. They are all within the realm of the mind. And they do not take us to our true home. No matter what kind of prayer it is, no matter what kind of words they are, no matter what we use. So when we talk of our true home, we are talking of something beyond the mind. And remember, it does not mean that we are all seekers of the true home. Many of us are seekers who go to masters for getting some little more money, a better car, to care their sickness, their karmic accounts, to lighten their karmic accounts. So many go for that only. If that happens, happy, perfect master. You got a daughter? Perfect master, sent him, sent us the daughter. So we are sometimes getting something part of the show, part of the carnival, getting something there and we say, that's what master is doing. There are masters who do that. And lot of them, thousands of them, who can do it today in this universe. But they can't be called perfect living masters. Then there are masters who will take you inside and give you inter internal experiences of heavens and hells and all those inner experiences which you can't see outside. They are also masters. But they are not perfect living masters because where they take you, you come back again and again to the same place. Some masters can take you to the top of the universal mind which we call top of Trikuti, where time and space begins, from where Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the God concepts of beginning, middle and end, 
has been created. They can take you there. But even they are not perfect living masters. Because even if you reach that level, you are not out of the cycle of birth and rebirth. The cycle goes on. The story is told of Lord Krishna, who was considered an incarnation of Vishnu, avatar of Vishnu, the god of sustenance. And he says to his childhood friend, Udo, they are both out in the fields tending cows. They were cowards. They took, took care of the village cows. And he, in the, while the cows are grazing, he is telling Udo. He says, Udo, what words he uttered, they say, are the words they sing in the town where he was born. And I went to that town to hear if they are still speaking those words. And in the Krishna's town, they sing that song. And the refrain of the song is the same words that they say Krishna spoke to Udo. And the words in their dialect, dialect is Udo Karman ki Gat Nyari say. The nature of karma is very strange. That the karma is a very strange thing. That's what he's telling Udo. And then he points out to an ant crawling there. He says, Udo, look at this ant crawling here. It's just a little insect. Once this ant has been Brahma, the creator of this universe, from Triguti, once this ant has been Indra, one of the big heavens in the astral plane, and he ruled that. Because of his karma, he's an ant today. Even if you reach that highest level, within the mind, you still come back. This cycle of birth and rebirth, which is based upon the law of karma, laws of cause and effect, which has been designed so successfully to hold souls here in this everlasting show. That applies even to people who reach that high level of experiences. So that will be a story. But the truth is that even if you go to that level and have an experience, you can fall down and come here again. People who have reached the level of seeing the causal region of creation, seen their own destinies and claimed that they had unshakable faith. When they were in the physical body, something untoward happened, accident happened, they lost their faith. Faith is not sustained by those experiences. An unshakable faith only comes when you realize beyond the mind who you are and then look at this universe, the created universe from there. But the Masters who go beyond that are very rare. It is only those rare masters who take us beyond the mind that we call them Param Sant Satguru. The definition of Param Sant Satguru is one who takes you beyond the mind into the totality of consciousness. Not even the realization you are an immortal soul. Even they are considered perfect living masters of a different order called Saad Gurus. In the northern Indian and descriptions of the Gurus, they have used the word Saad Guru for those who took you to the Parabrahm where you discovered the immortality of the soul and Sat Guru, the true Gurus, who took you even beyond that to totality and found out you are not even a separate soul. You are always a total. These are very rare. Why are they rare? When the world is full of seekers, why are these so rare? Great master used to say, in, in this age, which is Kali Yuga age, where the maximum seeking is going on in the midst of maximum distractions, even here in this time, there won't be more perfect living masters in the whole planet than those that can be counted on the fingers of your hands. It's eight fingers. Could be one, two, three, eight, at the most at one time. With billions of population, and millions of seekers. Why should we so few? Because there are so few seekers of that truth. The seekers are seeking different things. They are seeking intermediate forms of realization. And they find the kind of gurus they are seeking. But somebody who seeks the true home, somebody who seeks the ultimate totality of consciousness, the ultimate creative power, one who seeks that, even as a human being, 
will ultimately find a perfect living master even though the number is few because such seekers are few. And he will not be able to find by looking for one because unlike the masters who will be at different levels who will show their masters they will show that they are more than you that's why they can take you where they are perfect level masters will not show anything they will be ordinary human beings totally ordinary sometimes more ordinary than ordinary people and why are they so ordinary because they are not going to teach anything they are not teachers and nor are they going to show you anything they are going to pull you with the same power which occurs in the true home, the power of love. They will pull you with love, with no explanation, and you will say, what's happening to me? And you will be pulled. You say, something is going on. And they will find you wherever you are as a true seeker. You don't have to go around looking for them. So if you are a seeker of the ultimate truth, a perfect living master will appear in your life by coincidences, circumstances. He can create them. He will create them. And you will think, oh, that was a great chance it happened. And suddenly somebody gave me a book. I read the book and suddenly found somebody. Can you imagine how many of you sitting here have just come by coincidence, I know. How many of those who have gone to great master, I used to see them. Their stories, each individual story was so amazing. How by series of coincidences they landed up. Or the master let it up. Sometimes a poor seeker can be sitting far away. Master will go there. If he's going to be the master for that seeker. Now that raises a big question. The question is if I am a seeker, who is my master? First of all, masters have come as ordinary human beings, they've died. Can any one of those be my master? They were masters. So the scriptures say, so history says, so people say. That once upon a time, there was a perfect living master. Now have faith in that master. He'll save you. Can he save you? Maybe he can. I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him. He's somewhere in history. But maybe if I think of him, remember him, might save me. Now remember, when you think of him, think of whatever he might have looked like, whoever he was, your mind is making it up. Those who worship a master they have never seen, a master who is far away in time or in space, are worshipping their own mind. Mind creates all those images. My friends come to me, we have ascended masters sitting in the Himalayas near Tibet. They have never gone there. I have. I didn't see those masters there. I saw some other yogis there sitting in the caves there who are trying to find their own salvation. Here we are making up ascended masters in our mind and worshipping our mind, thinking we are worshipping masters. The mind is capable of all this stuff and we are being duped continuously in the outside world and in the inside trying to seek our truth. The mind makes up all these stories, makes up all these images, but it cannot make up in a physical body the image of a person who is alive, a friend who shakes your hand and says, how are you doing? You can't make up that unless you are able to recall personally recall the image of that person who was alive. Therefore, if you want to go beyond the mind, it's absolutely essential that whoever is your totem in your hand who takes you inside should be a perfect living master. Perfect in the sense he's gone beyond the mind. Every imperfection starts from the mind. You will never find imperfection beyond the mind. It's a creation of the mind. Perfectly perfect, this duality is created by the mind. So we want to go above imperfection or perfection. Then we, in terminology used here, we say perfect living, physically living. Master, not only physically living, living within reach where we can shake his hand. 
Sheikh Farid was a perfect living master. But before he became a master, he was initiated by Sheikh Qutbuddin, who was his master. And while Qutbuddin was alive, Farid was telling his son, go and get initiated. Master is alive, but he's getting old. Don't waste time. He's a human being, he's old, he will die. And then you won't get a chance to get initiated. Better take advantage while the master is alive. And like all young men, he would say, Master, Dad, I have to live my life, you know. One day I will go and get initiated when my time is over, right, and so on. Meanwhile, Kutbuddin died. When Sheikh Farid's son heard that Kutbuddin is dead, he ran. He shaved his head, which was customary in those days for initiation. He shaved his head and put his head on the feet of the dead body of Kutbuddin and said, Initiate me. You are still here. And then Farid tells his son, Son, this is the body of the person I have loved and respected the most in my life. And yet I must tell you, you got nothing. It's just a corpse. Just a piece of flesh and bones left. Master is not there. Even one second is too late. Therefore, a living master, living in a human form, who is constantly in his living form, aware of his true home, is needed if you want to go beyond the mind. Without that, you are worshipping the mind all the time. We just be guided by the mind. Mind can make up everything. But when you have a living perfect living master and you have met him, he has accepted you. He has told you, I accept you. And we will be friends forever. And we will together to our true home together. When that assurance is given, everything is done. Your journey ends there. Now it's up to the master. He has given you a promise. If you feel like going quickly, he'll take you quickly. You say, let me now take my time. He says, okay. Take a little time. If you want to stop on the way, he says, okay, do some sightseeing. <laughs> we'll go together. I won't leave you. If you don't want to go, I'll drag you. <laughs> take you to your true home. Such is the power of the acceptance by a perfect living master of a seeker who wants to go to his true home. Therefore, since such seekers who seek that are rare, masters are rare also, but they appear. Now, when a master like that, in a human form, with that kind of consciousness, moves around in this world amongst us, so many of us are affected who are not seeking that. We may be seeking something, but we are not seeking the truth, the ultimate truth. What happens to them? When they have a look at that man, something happens, but they don't know what. They are being marked to be seekers in the future that we want to see the two. Just because they have seen what we call have a darshan. They have seen the face of a human being who when they see that human being is already at the conscious level of totality. Seeing that face guarantees you will be a perfect seeker one day. So seekers are being created just by the presence of such a master. And those seekers in due course, they will find a master, perfect living master in this life or next life or next life, some life, they'll find and go back home. That is why if a person is able to see a perfect living master once, his journey of birth and rebirth is over. He has to go back home. Even if he is not accepted by that master. When I say there are masters who initiate us, there are masters who come and initiate us with their acceptance. They will go back home. They will not have a human birth again. But it does not mean that they will that they will not have other experiences for some time. I remember a young British girl. She was working with an army colonel in the Indian, uh, British army working in India at that time. She was a young girl, very pretty girl. She came to see great master. 
and attended this discourse. She was sitting on one corner. I was sitting in the other corner. I was looking at her. <laughs> she was pretty. <laughs> and I had a feeling, which I had experienced, that when you look at somebody at a distance, and you think about it, that person gets a feeling and turns around to glance at you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> but after all, she's sitting there. She was so pretty girl, sitting on the other side of the room. But she never turned her head to me. She was looking, gazing at great master, delivering a discourse in a language he didn't know. He was discoursing in Punjabi. She had no knowledge of the word of Punjabi. But she was just looking at him continuously. I was amazed by that experience. That how can this girl, coming from England, and having no experience of this language or what he's teaching, should be looking at him with such amazement. And she's a young girl. At this age, she should be trusted in things of the world. What's happened to her? Shortly after that, she went with a colonel who came to Shimla, another town where they were headquartered, and wrote a letter in a few days. She was initiated next morning after I saw her. She wrote a letter. And those letters which used to come in English to Great Master, there were four or five people who used to reply to them, English knowing people, who used to reply to those letters on behalf of Great Master. He would tell them in Punjabi what the reply should be, and they translate into English. Sometimes their own inflection in the translator would come. Today, when I read spiritual gems, letters from Great Master, I can tell you which was the translator. A little bit of their own thing comes in. But the letter that she wrote came into the hands of my grandfather, by Bishan Das Puri. He was the one who was one of the uh, letter writers for Great Master. And he made a copy of that letter, that girl, and sent a reply to her from Great Master. That copy he turned to me. I was young, very young. He said, to me, you keep this copy, it will be useful for you. <coughs> I still have that. Copy of the letter that she wrote to Great Master after three days of initiation. She wrote, as, the, as you know, in meditation I made some progress. I was able to cross the astral plane and there was so much distraction there. <coughs> Far more distraction than there is in this world. But if you were not there, I would have been caught there forever. Holding you, holding your hand, I moved on. And I moved on and saw the creation of this universe from Brahm. I am now near the great darkness of our world. And I know I cannot cross without your love and help. Something like that. A detailed a description of her inner experience in meditation after three days of meditation it touched me so much. I said, it is not the age. How could this girl do it? It came to my knowledge much later what these people who are so young and make progress, they have done a lot of homework in previous lives. It's not so suddenly that it happens. It's not a one lifetime course. This is a According to Swamiji, Seth Shivdyal Singh of Agra, who set up the Radha Swami faith, according to him, it takes four lives to just reach the level where you can go in. And he says, about four lives. Ek janam, I'll, tell him, I'll tra translate it for you later. Ek janam gur bhakti. Janam dusre naam. Teethre janam turiyapad. Chothe me nijdaam. That first life is only to develop love and devotion for the master. Second life is to get initiated by that master. Third life is to reach the universal mind. It's only the fourth life you can go beyond and reach your true home. So he himself says, there is a four life course. So when I came to this country, people met me who were initiates of different masters. And they told me, Oh, we have to wait for fourth life. I said, how do you know which life this one is? <laughs> Maybe you covered the three already. I said, this is a mental, mental tardiness. 
which says, no, no, wait, wait. This common trick of the mind to prevent you from going within. Because mind has established his empire over here. So the mind doesn't want to leave this. And therefore, four lives, it does not mean every time you come, there are four more to come. You have done work before, before you get initiated. You have had previous experiences with masters, may not be perfect living masters. They were masters who you thought were the right ones for you at that time. They took you up to a certain level. And then they could not take you anymore. But your seeking went on for more. Another master took you higher. Till you found the perfect living master who took you where you originally were seeking to go. So seeking is also in stages. And spiritual revelation, spiritual growth is also in stages. And comes. People ask me today. Which master should I follow? The, the difficulty is there are too many masters. According to great master, even in his time, he said there are more masters than disciples now. So there's a big choice. So which master should be followed? So I, I can't comment upon any master where he is. I only comment upon one master. Azur Maharaj Baba Saul Singh did. He proved to me to the hilt he was a perfect living master by delivering what he promised. That's my only way to say so. I can't comment on anybody else. How far they are, where they are, I can't say. But if somebody asks me this question, which master should I follow? I give the simplest way. Whichever master pulls you with his love, follow. At that time, he may be the master for you. If the master does not give what you are seeking is, you will automatically find another master. Don't worry about it. Just follow where love guides you, where the pull of love takes you. That's the secret of seeking with love and devotion as you get it. So when I define this way, then people make a decision. One person had a difficulty. He wrote to me, I have to cho choose between two masters. By your definition, Whoever pulls you with love, I should choose. They both pull me with love. Now what should I do? I said, people have a hard time to find one master. You are very lucky you found two. You can follow anyone. Because it doesn't matter. Masters are symbols of your own totality inside. Masters in their physical form are not the reality. They are as unreal as the rest of creation. But they are symbolic of what is true inside you. They translate into the reality outside for you to guide you to go inside and go there. Perfect living masters never say follow us. They say go within and find us. Your, our reality will be found within yourself. Big distinction from many other masters who say follow us and come to us. There are some obvious characteristics of these perfect living masters. Which one cannot mistake when you come across masters who, pray, who say we are masters. Rule them out. Because if one has to say this to us, then how is he pulling us? How, how does he know we are seekers? If he knows we are seekers, why does he have to say so? And if he is extraordinary, he can read our mind, he can tell us what is in our mind, he can tell us. He is a psychic, he is not a master. He's a mind reader. Masters don't have to be that. Perfect living masters are ordinary beings, just like us. Why are they so ordinary? Because true friendship and love is between ordinary people. Let me tell you this. Their method of taking us back home is through the power of love. And love is experienced in the physical world with a physical being like ourselves. Not a person who is high or low. They become like us. They come to our level. If they come to the level of a high person, they become high. Come to the level of a poor person, they become poor. They come to our level so they can be our permanent friends, true friends. With no doubt about it. That their love and friendship is the only unconditional friendship and love that you can experience. I am, I am, you know, I am going to be 89 years old. Very soon. And in all this lifetime, I have not found the kind of love, unconditional love, which I found from the Master. 
a perfect living master has such love for us that once he says I accept you his love never changes if you love him he will love you if you hate him he will love you if you hurt him he will love you if you kill him he will love you with no change very few human beings can do that yet there is an ordinary human being who can do that such is the obvious characteristic of a perfect living master. He will be totally ordinary, not show by outside miraculous things. He will show private miracles to you. Things will happen, you will know they are happening because of the master. An internal experience, an external experience. But, he, you have a great experience, you go to him and say, I, Master, thank you. So what was that? <laughs> master, you know it already. I have sometimes problem. I tell people I'm not a master. Somebody comes to me, tell me what's the answer. I say, what's your question? You know it already. <laughs> now what answer am I going to get? <laughs> so the the truth is that the ordinariness is their beauty. Their friendship with an ordinary person is the beauty of friendship and love in this world. And they come into this world to take us out. And that is why that's the characteristic. They have come to give. They live their life according to the destiny they have chosen for the ordinary body in which they are sitting. They are born like us. They die like us. They live like us. And I sometimes say, as men, they do sure, sure, sure like us. You know, that is shit, shave and shower. <laughs> They do everything like ordinary human beings. They fall sick like us. They get medication like us. They have exactly the same type of karma we all have. There's no difference in that. The difference is in the level of awareness, the level of consciousness which they carry with them all the time. It's that which affects us, that which pulls us. It's the consciousness that they carry at all times, not sometimes, all the time. That is why they are different. They do not come to make an earning, a living out of people who follow them. They, they make their own living. Kabir was a perfect living master. There were very rich people who were his followers. He was just a weaver. And they told him, why don't you come and live in our palace? He said, no, my destiny is to be a weaver. I am a weaver. He did all his work as a perfect living master, as a weaver weaving cloth. Ravi Das was a cobbler. He was a perfect living master. He was mending shoes, making shoes and mending shoes. Lived outside the palace of King Pipa, who invited him to live in the palace so many times. He said, no, my destiny is to be a cobbler. I sit outside. And he repaired shoes. There's a story told about Ravi Das that once the king, who was a follower of Ravi Das, the king was a disciple of Ravi Das, the king said, people tell me Ravi Das in his good mood gives you instant knowledge. I should go and get it. So early morning one day, the king got up and he cloaked himself so nobody saw him. He just went to the hut where Ravi Das was early morning prepared some shoes. The dipping leather in water, softening it and attaching it to the shoes. At that time the king appeared. The king said, and the Ravi Das wanted to get up. He said, no, no, I have not come as a king. I have come as a beggar. I beg you, give me something. People tell that you have the power to give. Ravi Das said, yes. And he took a little bit of the water from that little pot in which the leather, leather was soaked. Dirty water with the leather in it. He took a little bit and said, drink this. And the king took it and saw dirty water. He said, I didn't come for that. He allowed the water to go down his sleeve and ran. Thank you, thank you, and ran away. He was so bothered about the fact that the sleeve had got wet with that dirty water. He took his shirt off and found there was a stain on it. And he said, this stain must go. People are going to ask me where did it come from. Took the shirt off early morning. Told his confidential advisor. 
This is secret stuff, secret mission. Take this shirt immediately to the washerman who is also living on the uh, palace complex. Take it to the washerman, get it washed right now. It should be delivered clean and pressed in the morning. So the shirt was delivered early morning to the washerman who was sleeping. He woke up. He took the shirt. He saw his skin. His daughter got up. Little young girl. She got up. What's it, dad? He said, the king has sent this and there's a stain. I want to get rid of the stain. The daughter said, I'll help you. So to take the stain off, the daughter began to suck upon it. She thought she may be able to suck the dirt out of that. As she was doing it, she got enlightened. <laughs> Without knowing. Next morning, she was talking about the higher levels of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was surprised. People all came, began to go to her. The king heard that the washerman's daughter has got enlightened suddenly and everybody is coming to her. So he went to see. He said, let me get something from her now. I got only dirty water from Ravidas. <laughs> Maybe she'll give me something better. So when he went to the washerman's house, she, the girl got up. I want to salute you. She said, no, 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 no. It's the same thing. I have not come as a king. I have come as a beggar. I know you got enlightened. Everybody is getting benefit from you. I want those blessings. The girl says, I have not got up to salute you because you, you are a king. I have got up to salute you because all I got was from you. It was all in the sleeve of your shirt that you sent to me. It contained everything. And Ravidas felt so bad, he ran back to the master. No, I am king then felt so bad, he ran back to the master, Ravidas, and said, Master, I made a big mistake. I didn't swallow that water that you were talking of. They gave me that prashad, that special nectar, whatever it was there, it made that girl enlightened. Give me a little bit of that more. He said, such moments come very rarely. You woke up early morning that day with such seeking, with such internal seeking. He came to me. When people come with such internal seeking, so strong, Masters do give something extraordinary and they get an experience. Now, all I can say is meditate for 25 years more, you'll get exactly what the girl got. <laughs> these, these are, there are a number of stories like that. This is the same story as King Janak who got enlightened from Ashtabakar. And then when he said, that's good, you give me this, I'll keep it. He said, no, 25 years, you'll get it again. Sometimes the masters give an odd and we get enlightened. Masters give her a little sip of water, we get enlightened. But then, to go through the normal channel, meditation, controlling your mind, repeating words, trying your best, it takes time, it can take 25 years. I am telling you these stories just to tell you the importance of a perfect living master. A living master. If you haven't seen a master, then what kind of friend can that be? Do you realize that every time you say, I have a master you have never seen, you are talking to your mind? Is there any other way you can make it up? You are worshipping your mind. There is absolute need if you want to go beyond the mind to have a perfect living human being as a master. A master who is perfect in the sense that he is carrying his awareness at all levels. Simultaneously, when he's a human being in front of us. That's a perfect living master. Secondly, I want to emphasize the importance of starting your journey, spiritual journey, from going within, behind the eyes. Your attention is coming out from the soul. The soul is piercing the attention through the mind, through the sense perceptions, through the physical body but located in the wakeful state behind the eyes. You should feel you are sitting there, not make up an image of yourself sitting there. Thirdly, understand there is no greater bliss that I can describe, no greater ecstasy, no greater joy than the joy of merger with your own totality.
merger their own creative power that we call God and worship as God, ultimate God. I would like to do some real meditation with you. How many of you have come for real meditation and not for a talk? <laughs> Very good. Talk is finished. Meditation will start. When will it start? At three o'clock. <laughs> we have a few minutes for any questions if you have sent any questions if you haven't we'll have more time for questions and answers later on uh, you have any questions yeah we have questions okay we'll take up a few one or two questions now does the student of the spiritual pen need to study ego is there any benefit in studying ego Love, student. <laughs> Does the student of spiritual path need to study ego? Is there any benefit in studying ego? There is no use in studying ego. The use is in not using your ego. Getting rid of your ego. And it's not easy to do it. Because everything we do in this world is with ego. I is there in everything. I can do this. I can meditate. I can do this. I can I can struggle. I, I is there in everything we do here. To take this I away is very difficult. Somebody said to me, how do we avoid the I? I said, it's very difficult to avoid. There is a certain practice I will tell you about. But you have to make some progress in... Um, defeating the eye by using the eye and seeing its failure. When the eye fails, then you have a choice to look for something else. If the eye doesn't fail, you think more eye, more struggle, more effort will work. When it doesn't work, then you come to say, what else is there? What else is there is that if you are a disciple of a perfect living master and can manifest imaginatively or through practice of meditation the form of that master which you have seen outside if you can imagine that form or see the radiant form on the astral plane of that master and surrender to that form that that form is doing everything and not you I disappears when you leave everything and say this is master's work he is doing it ego disappears Ego does not disappear by crushing it. Some people try to crush ego by thinking highly about it, that I don't want my ego, so I have to be humble. So they try to be so humble, they tell everybody, I am the humblest of all. <laughs> they are the egoist of all. <laughs> they are so egoistic that they have classified themselves high because of their humility. <laughs> that is not humility. Therefore, the easiest way to fight ego or leave it behind is to surrender to the image of the master and think master doing everything. Good? Master, I watched you did a good job. Bad? How could you do that? <laughs> so once you are able to do that, the problem of ego is solved. All other methods only strengthen the ego. So instead of spreading ego, Try to defeat it. Master, would you please elaborate on if in this room there is only one dreamer and everyone else are appearing in his or her dream, or are all people here dreaming collectively? Master, would you please elaborate that in this room there is only one dreamer? And everyone else are appearing in higher dream or all people are dreaming collectively. Let us take the example of our own dreams when we go to sleep. When you sleep and have a dream and you see 20 people in the dream and you talk to them, argue with them, fight with them, love them, do all kinds of activities with those 20 and then suddenly you ask, is there one dreamer here or there are 20 dreamers? 
the question will be, they'll say, no, we don't know. Maybe we're all dreaming. Maybe we are not. They can't find an answer. Which one is dreaming out of those 20 people? Then you wake up. Those 20 disappear. Then you know who the dreamer is. You were the dreamer in the wakeful state. You were not a dreamer in the dream. You were a creation of the dream during the dream. Therefore, the many you saw in the dream were the creation of one dreamer who when he woke up, how he created them. <coughs> the same is true of this dream. In this dream, we are not dreaming. That is a dream. In the dream, is a real. When we wake up, you discover that all the people in this room that you saw were one dreamer's dream. When you reach the end of this wakeful journey to the top of creation, you will find there was only one dreamer, the totality of creation, and all the many were created by the process of dreaming within dreaming within dreaming. Therefore, to put the question, who is dreaming here? None of us. And if you really want to know, can we somehow find out who the dreamer possibly could be? Then the self that says, in each one of us, there's a self that says, I exist as the dreamer. You wake up, you'll find that was the only dreamer. And all the rest were dream. There's no such thing as collective dream. And therefore, a dream is individual. A dream arises from one. And that is the real secret. How the reality and truth is only one. And the rest is dreamlike. The whole creation is dreamlike. But dreams look real while you're dreaming. Only when you wake up, they become a dream. Similarly, this dreamlike state which we call the wakeful state. When you wake up, you'll find there was only one dreamer. Sitting here, you cannot say which one of us is dreaming. Because we've been created by the single dreamer. Of course, you can know. If you have woken up once, you might carry that little knowledge in a dream. Most people forget. Every day we sleep. Every night we sleep. And every night we have some dream. We wake up and know the dream. It just fades away. Within 30 seconds, we forget the dream. According to the dream experts, dreams don't last too long. Sometimes we say we never dreamt. Because we forget them as they come. The last dream disappears in 30 seconds. But we don't know it's a dream till we wake up. In the dream, suppose you come to know. There are some dreams where we can say there's a dream. I've had those dreams, you have had, many of you have had dreams, there's the dream, you said, I know it's a dream. If you know it's a dream, what do you do? You tell everybody there, come, I'll tell you, it's a dream. And when you wake up, you don't tell anybody. Although you are speaking the truth in the dream, the truth is you are saying it is a dream, but you don't know it is. You don't have the awareness of it. The awareness only comes when you wake up. The same truth prevails here. When you wake up from the state, then only you will know who the dreamer is and you can call the dreamer the self. The self is always the dreamer and every time the self creates many and when it wakes up and becomes a single self, every time he creates the many at any level of creation, wakes up is one self. The self is the only reality. All rest are dreams, all creation, including such kind, including the experience of a huge universe created somewhere. They are all being created from the self, which is the totality of consciousness from where everything is being created by the power of consciousness. Okay, we'll take a break for lunch and come back and we'll do meditation.